are officially back on the training pitch, obviously with proper protocols implemented, of course. Now, Dre, I want to ask you how you are, but I know you hate that question. So I'm going to switch it up. Go on. I'm going to add some new flavor to Onside. So I want you to tell me something interesting or something funny that happened to you since last Friday. Okay, well, I've got nothing funny on the spot, but um, I, I will say <laughs> my favorite part of the show at the beginning is always your pronunciation of Andres Cordero. It gets better every week. I love it. Um, that aside, I think I'm collecting hobbies, honestly, is what I'm doing with my time off. Like, I picked up cycling pretty early on, and uh, now I've picked up photography. So I think I'm in the process of becoming the renaissance man and trying to come out on the other side of this thing a little better. Okay, two things before we move on. on. Do you have the proper, like, tight cycling kit? Like, the, the nut huggers all the way up to the top? Uh, embarrassingly, yes. Embarrassingly, I'm absolutely yes. wearing uh, bike shorts. <laughs> a hundred points. Oh, I love it. Okay, well, Dre, happy hour makes yet another appearance on Onside. But before we get to any of that, we have a very important guest joining us today. Dr. Brian Arwari, Neurocognitive Kinesiology at the University of Miami. He also has multiple degrees. This guy's resume is no joke. First degree, personality psychology. Second degree, uh, cognitive psychology. And the third, PhD in psychopsychology. Now, it is an absolute honor to have you on the show. So, Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I was going through your resume and I literally couldn't believe it. You put my schooling to absolute shame. But again, it, it, it's such a pleasure having someone like yourself on the show because right now we're going through a world pandemic. No one knew this was going to happen. No one can plan for something like this. But obviously, I want to take it to the athletic side of it. So these players have been out for months, obviously had two games um, already on the season. So what does something like this, the COVID-19, do to the player's mindset? Um, what would you, how can you describe this? Well, I think there's, there's like multiple levels of analysis, right? So one is uh, just uncertainty, right? Nobody knows what's going on and how long this is going to last. And athletes are aware that they have a limited time, right? Uh, and so um, they, they have a particular job in that you can't wait two or three years. And there's no substitute. So, for example, my classes went online and they continued pretty much normally. But there's no equivalent to that for an athlete, right? Uh, and, and so that, that's one of the problems. The uncertainty of when you're going to come back the uncertainty of uh, just general being healthy you know the number one job for an athlete is is to be healthy mm -hmm. and so that's that's another level too um dr awari thanks again for joining us i just i'm curious uh mls was suspended major league soccer suspended after just two rounds very early on and so you talk about players who are losing time but they do have a short career but in many of the cases it's young players who have just changed clubs they're at a new team they're in a new city they're essentially starting a new life and that can be, especially for players sort of on the lower end of the uh, pay scale, starting out their careers who aren't surrounded by friends and family in a new city, could be really tough mentally. And so I'm wondering what can players do to deal with things like loneliness to avoid depression when a time that's supposed to be sort of a time of discovery and new friends and whatnot turns into a time of isolation? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, especially because um there's a there's a, a, a pretty much a strong there's a strong link between uh, stress and injury for example right mm -hmm. and uh, and you see that you see that in players private lives you know if, if a player is going through something in their lives then they're much more likely to get injured and you see that also just in general in terms of public life so for example if you have a player that has a you know, a 10-year career span, and let's say it's a player you don't know, a player X, and I say, you know, uh, what are the chances that this player got hurt at any moment in time? The chances that they get hurt are much higher during stressful times, so it's championships, Olympics, that type of stuff, right? Yeah. And so moving and changing teams, especially for a young person, is, is a stressful moment in their life because they're changing the life, they're changing their career path in a certain way, and now they're blocked they're kind of interrupted in this thing and it's a it's a new world and and there's not a formula for that right because they can't reach out to a peer and say hey when you had to be stuck for a pandemic what did you do right there's no mentorship there's no guidance it's uh it's it's a brand new world for everybody 
Now, Brian, I have a, a question for you. Obviously, I was a player and I never really believed in the mental side of it until obviously our national team started getting successful. We won bronze in the 2012 Olympics and our psychologist, we actually had a psychologist that worked with the All Blacks uh, the New, in New Zealand. And it completely changed the way that I went into training. It completely changed the way I went into games. Um, and it, it completely changed how it was playing. So there was, we had like redhead and bluehead triggers, how to get out of a dark time in a game. Now, these players are sitting at home, like Dre said, some of them without family members. So someone like yourself, how important is the mental side of it to prep coming out of the other end of this COVID-19? Um, uh, extremely right and mm -hmm. uh, obviously you know uh, I'm biased and so I would say that maybe even more than the physical because a lot of times the physical yeah. is easier to recover than the mental mm -hmm. right um, and um, there, there's traps that people fall into and you know there, there are too many to go into but one of them is um, we call eternalizing the present people tend to think that the way things are that the way things are gonna be forever and, you know, uh, we're all guilty of this. Everybody does this. When things are going great, it's going to be like this forever. This is awesome. And when things are going bad, it's going to be like mm -hmm. this forever. This is horrible. Um, you know, just think of the COVID situation. Right before, it seemed like, you know, the economy was going great and everybody was, you know, this is going to ha this is going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. And again, right now, the mental state is this is going to go on forever. And so there's a bunch of mental traps that people fall into. So I think the first step is just getting educated on... One of, what are the mechanisms that people fall into? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I compare that to kind of like, you know, when you when you read a book and you have that thought of like, you read a line in a book and say like, that's what I thought. I just never, somebody else put it into words for me. Mm -hmm. And so you can come to a few realizations if you do that. And if you start looking for these things, you start to realize that you you do these things and you, you fall into these traps and mechanisms and, and that could help you get out of it. You know, there's a, actually, a, there's a concept that I couldn't put in the words that my sort of research for you of you did. That's uh, psychophysiology. Like I've always been fascinated with that aspect of sports, but never had a term for it. Never knew sort of where that study. And I know that's an area of expertise um, for you. And so athletes often describe being in the zone, that moment of extreme focus. And I'm wondering if we know more now about sort of what's happening in the brain that that sort of accounts for that phenomena. And just to tie this a little bit to the pandemic and to the COVID-19. Um, a crisis when sport does return it looks like it's going to be at least temporarily uh, with no fans and so I'm wondering how that has an effect on um, that that feeling of supreme focus it, you know beneficial in the sense that maybe eliminates some distractions detrimental and that maybe eliminates some motivation so what's your take on that you know they, they kind of overlap in a way so mm -hmm. uh, let's start with the last question first so um, you know normally there's a home field advantage and uh the home field advantage you have to if you think about it it has to be attributed to fans right because you know let's say let's take a soccer field it's regular mentation size everywhere and so the difference is are the fans but they're not allowed to touch the ball and so what do the fans do for you well they they, they cheer right that they give you uh what what uh we call uh, a boost in arousal right and think you think of arousal as physiological activation Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the volume knob and how high you turn on that knob. And um, and that can help people or hurt people to get into the zone, depending on kind of what type of sport you're doing and what type of person you are. So let's go with the sport route. Yeah. Right? Um, in soccer, it definitely almost always helps. Um, you, because you can you can kind of parse this out and say, well, if cheering fans help you, why don't we use it for important things, right? Why don't we have uh, you know, 30 people going through in, in, in an operating room and scream at the surgeon yeah. when he's cutting, right? Because that's, you know, that's counterproductive because that activity requires kind of like calm levels, right? And so being in the zone is when you could kind of like turn all the knobs to their optimal level in terms of what's the arousal set point that you function better at? What's the physical activation that you function better at? What's the muscle tension that you function? And it could be different for each person, right? So some people have a, let's say, a, a game ritual where they'll go into a corner and they'll put their headphones on and they'll listen to like, you know, battle music. And some people just go off into a corner and meditate 
Yeah. And so it's, it's different for everybody. But we do know what happens because we have these amazing machines now where it's a, think of like a shower cap that you could put on a person that has embedded electrodes. And we could, we could see the activity in the brain. And so we can know when the brain is functioning at optimal levels for that person. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is that then you could train that person for that. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And it's funny that you did say that because we actually used to train our brains uh, with a video game. So it, it, to help us stay really focused and, and in blue head, that's what we called it on our national team. So that was kind of like the running joke uh, in game. So I want to ask you, obviously it's a group of 20 to 24 different personalities, different players, like you just said, that react differently to in-game. So I guess moving forward, if these games are end up playing behind closed doors, what are three things that you would say to these group of players just to keep them mentally focused and mentally on task? I'd say that um, you you have to recognize that, uh, that uh, we're in an evolving situation Right, because a lot of times just thinking about why isn't the thing the way I want it to be keeps you is one of those traps, mm -hmm. right? And you don't realize that the different thing or the new thing, you know, is not as bad as you thought. But as long as you keep referencing it to, yeah, but it's not what I'm used to. And I think the problem with, with uh, athletes especially, this is true for everybody, but athletes especially, they're athletes for a long time. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you're an athlete, you probably started when you were a kid. And so that's all you know. And also you're an athlete 24 hours a day, right? If when I come home from work, I could sit on the couch and I could, if I want, I could eat a bowl of junk food, but an athlete can't do that. And so you identify with what you do and the fan and the fan relationship is a part of that. And so playing in an empty stadium is, is you have to adapt to that, to that new reality. And then also part of it is the expectation. You know, a lot of players had the dream of this is what they wanted when they grew up, yeah. right? You know, you know, you're an eight-year-old boy, you fantasize about, I'm going to walk out there and people are going to cheer and it's going to be awesome. And walking out into an empty stadium is, is not the same, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, and then I, I would kind of go back to the point of, you try to be mentally flexible in you have to, you're going to have to adapt to different situations mm -hmm. and, uh, and just kind of make your peace with that. Um, sure. and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Keep going. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's it. Uh, you make your peace with that because a lot of time energy is spent on resistance to change. And if you mm -hmm. can in embrace it, even if it's not the thing you ultimately want, right then then that that gets you somewhere so i actually want to so interesting i want to shift this a little bit into uh, fans away from players for a moment because i've always thought of sports as maybe like the ideal area to study cognitive science so it, i'm very curious I, I love having you on here because i actually i'm as excited to talk to you about this as i would be to talk to any player about soccer I, this area fascinates me and you're allowed to commit sort of cognitive biases in 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 sports that in other areas of society we just, we think you were crazy or you were an outcast. We would lock you up basically. Uh, down to the war paint and the war drums, um, especially speak, speaking specifically about soccer. And so I'm wondering what is it about sports that made it the area where you wanted to um, involve yourself in cognitive study? What, what was the attraction of sports itself? Um, well, you know, you, you, again, you, you kind of centered the target there. It is uh, not only you're allowed to be biased, but kind of that's the whole point. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, you 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 criticize people kind of that aren't biased. Says, oh, you're a fair weather fan. You know, you're supposed <laughs> to be for. Yeah. You know, like you're supposed to uh, like the team and say good things about the team, even when they suck, even when they're bad, which is, you know, that's what a true fan is. Right. You, you, you say mm -hmm. you, you see the fans not in the good times, but in the bad times. And uh, so the bias is not only accepted, it's celebrated. Right. I'm a true fan and people will tell you, I was a fan when this team didn't win for 20 years. I was a fan and you just, you know, are not now. And they say that as a compliment, right? Where anywhere else it would be shunned. I think it goes back to literally, you know, the word tribal is tossed around, but, uh, but this is literally tribal. The mm -hmm. conflict between tribes 
you know, was historically physical. And then uh, we kind of evolved that into a, a battle that is still physical, but symbolic, right? There's no, there's the defeated, but not dead, right? And uh, you, you vanquish the enemy. You, you take something of theirs. I took your trophy. I took your, your, I took your flag. I took something of yours. And then all the tribal culture, you know, the war pain. You said the war drums. As you know, there's literally war drums and things, right? They go in and they drum and they, and they have the thing and, and they have the, the, the face paint and, and the chants. And, the, and so it's a, it builds a sense of community. Right. And it cuts across anything like we are the same in this. It's us against the others. So then if I could add to that, then um, because sports are so tied to our identity um, and to our relationships, uh, we talk you know, in this interview about how it affects players to be without the thing they love. But what about the effect this has on fans who, whose identity is very closely tied to a team that they support, who you know, call their, their fathers, their, their daughters, their mothers to talk about you know, last night's game. Uh, does the absence of, of sport sort of exacerbate potential mental health issues um, or just daily life mental health? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people think that uh, that that people fall into mental health issues, and they do because of severe things that happen in their life, right? So, which is which is true, but also there's a there's another mechanism is you could have a lot of little things that go wrong, and or you could take away kind of you know <clears throat> pressure valves that people normally use to relieve pressure in an acceptable way, mm -hmm. and if you can't do it that way, then you kind of internalize it. Um, yeah, and, and it's and, and not only it's it's for them uh, personally, but interpersonal relationships, as you were saying, they call their dads. And mm -hmm. so, you know, depending on geography, but and depending on the sport, but a lot of times the number one predictor of what fan, uh, of, of what club uh, you're a fan of is, you know, where you're born and what your parents were a fan of, right? It, it's just familiar. Mm -hmm. And so not only I take away your opportunity to watch the game, I take away your opportunity to talk to your dad about it, to talk to your cousin and your brother about it. And a lot of times those are the, you know, those are lines of communication that people have. Um, you know, it's uh, the Louis Armstrong line when he says, uh, I see friends shaking hands and saying, how do you do? And they're really saying, I love you, right? When people talk about soccer, it's a proxy for, you know, I'm, I'm talking about you and we're shooting the breeze and we're keeping our relationship fresh and we're exchanging ideas. It's a channel. It's, it's, it's a way that people can channel their emotions, mm -hmm. especially men, right? Men aren't really good at sharing emotionally. And so it's a way that's okay for men to, to communicate openly. Uh, well, Dr. Arwari, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I wish we could speak to you for hours. I'd love to grab a cup of coffee with you or chat with you after a match because you are so interesting and so intelligent. Uh, but thank you again for coming on Onside. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, don't go anywhere because when we come back, I mentioned that the players are back on the grass. But what are the protocols that are allowing this to happen? Stay tuned.
welcome back into Onside and what an incredible man Dr. Arwari is. I can't wait, Dre, to catch up for a cup of coffee with him. And he even said that we can come into his facility and he will scan our brain. So I'm definitely taking him up on that. Now, we've all seen on the Inter-Miami CF Digital channels that the players are back onto the pitch. And we've got Rob Liss here to tell us just how it's been coming back into monitor training. Today was great. It was a lot of fun to be back. Uh, I know the setup is a little different, but it's not as if we stopped training. Uh, once we found out that we had to self-quarantine, they, they gave us weekly training regimens and we were running, running a lot. Um, so what today provides is just a safer environment for players to come and, and sort of see each other from a distance, but continue to train and, and work hard as, as we gear up for the season. Yeah, the process has been a long one. Uh, a lot of conversations with the league, a lot of conversations with local governments, because the league understands that there's, there's a bigger thing at hand and they don't want to disrespect in any way while also maintaining a competitive environment for players. And, and so I felt like they've been very meticulous. Um, it's been a very long process, but nonetheless, here we are, we're on the field. And I know not, not all the teams are training around the league in this capacity, but it's not a matter of if, it's just when. And hopefully with each passing day and each passing week, more teams are able to utilize their outdoor facilities. Now I want to walk us all through the actual protocols and procedures that are taking place to make the return to training happen. Number one, access to the actual facility is prohibited. Fields are divided into four quadrants. All equipment must be sanitized and cleaned after each use. All players must complete a standard assessment prior to arrival. Temperature checks upon arrival as well. Players must use prote protective equipment to and from the fields and to and from the vehicle. So Dre, loads of protocols, loads of procedures, yeah. but the main thing is, is these players are back on the training pitch and back kicking a ball around. Yeah, to be honest, seeing this was like visual ASMR for me, right? I just so, my, I think my ACD acted up. Uh, seeing how organized and how like neat <laughs> everything is where players are mm -hmm. essentially training in like one quarter of the field and it's also standardized so mm -hmm. um, organized that it was just almost artistic uh, to see. I think uh, to tie this into the conversation we had in our first segment, players are sort of ritualistic. They're, they're used to their, their, um, their rituals before training, before games. Um, and I think for a lot yeah. of them, just putting on the training top, putting on uh, the cleats again and stepping on uh, the training grass is going to be a huge, huge boost uh, to their morale. Just to, to feel like a player again um, is going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a huge deal. I mean, a lot of people are saying uh, a shorter preseason for return to training. Unfortunately, you can do all the fitness you want, but fitness on the field with a ball, with the grass is completely different. I talked to a few of the players after returning to training sessions that almost individualized training sessions, passing of the ball and, and the social distancing. They said that they were exhausted because like I said, you can run in your house, you can do as many push-ups as you want, but football fitness is completely different than going for a 40 minute run so it's just great to see the players back and inter miami have done a brilliant job the schedule that's been sent out of players of what time they need to come in uh which locker room they need to use which parking lot they need to use it's every little detail that hasn't gone unnoticed and every rock has it, it, i mean they've just been incredible it's good to be to have them back on the pitch to be honest it means that we're a little bit closer uh to getting soccer back in our lives um and i'm sure that they appreciate uh, the, the chance to train with their coaches again. Just that, that human interaction once more, even if it is on a very limited basis, will be a really big deal. Uh, Kaylin, but if we could transition, because we've been talking about sort of how training changes um, as players get back into camp, but the game could change as well if and when, mm -hmm. or when it gets back on their way. Um, and that is maybe more relevant to European soccer at the moment than Major League Soccer, but I wouldn't rule it out for our league either because there's been a lot of talk about uh, what was just approved last week by the international board in the UK, which is the use of five substitutes in game. And I think actually this is a fascinating um, amendment really to the rules because it's not intended to be a permanent rule change. It's intended to be to deal with the condensed schedule, the short schedule that so many of the European leagues mm -hmm. will have as they try and wrap things up by the end of June. It seems almost impossible. And so there's so much of a tax on the legs of the players at that, uh, mm -hmm. with that regularity of playing that uh, the international board decided to, to throw out the concept of a 
five substitution game. And the really interesting thing here is that you would think, well, five substitutions, that's a lot of time wasting. People use that tactically for you know, the purposes that are not intended. Uh, but there was a stipulation in, the, in that rule change that all five subs have to be made within three in-game instances. And I think it's the unintended consequences that I find fascinating about this, like how managers will use it in order to uh, maybe have a higher press game or less of a press game, whether mm -hmm. teams swap out most of their back line or their entire front line late in games when they need to catch up. I think this adds uh, a little tactical wrinkle to the game and how these substitutions would be used that I find fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. I remember uh, I got asked this question on air the other day and at first I was against it, but then you look at all the games that they're gonna need to cram in together, especially in the MLS, the travel. They haven't even got to that yet. How are they gonna travel from West Coast to East Coast? But the, the, t the toll that that takes on players is immense. The recovery and the rest is huge. So at first I was against it, now I'm kind of for it. But like you just said, tactically, does this change the game? Mentally, does this change the game? keeping players mentally focused on the bench, because like you said, three subs usually. So what about those other two subs that may not get used? Mentally, they are gonna have to be changed. There's just so many moving parts, so, but Dre, at the end of the day, if football kicks <laughs> off, I am going to be the happiest fan and the happiest ex-soccer player in the yeah. world. I miss it so much. So one of the things that I think will be really interesting is this is meant to sort of ease the, the wear on the legs of players that are playing um, you know, every two days or every three days. But this could also, I think, speed up the pace of the game because you can see a scenario where a team hasn't used any of their substitutions sure. in the first half. So they're gonna use five subs in the second half. Virtually half the team, half the field players are gonna be swapped out at some point. And you can do a two, two, and one situation where it keeps the pace going uh, late in games in a way when, when games tend to slow down a little bit. And I just, I, sure. I wonder what that experience will be like. I'm, I'm fascinated to see because I think it'll be a, a really good um, adaptation, at least in the short term, for a lot of the European leagues. I wonder with Major League Soccer, because there's a bit more time uh, left before the season is supposed to be finalized, whether it'll be a necessity, but it's interesting nonetheless. Now people just have another thing to complain about. You got VAR, you got refing, you got five substitutes, and I will be for sure one of those complaining about it probably on social media at the end of the day. But as long as player safety is the, is the number one concern, their return to training, everything's done with proper protocols, and like you touched on, or Robles touched on, Inter Miami has been lucky enough to return to training. There's some clubs that haven't returned to training. Minnesota United still haven't returned to training because the governor hasn't lifted the mandate yet. So at least the guys are back in. They're getting that football fitness in. They're getting touches on the ball. They're getting social distancing, but socialize again around their teammates, which is huge mentally for them just to just to interact with someone. A lot of these guys, like the, the doctor had said in our first segment, that they come from different countries, that they have no family here. A lot of these guys may be single, that don't have girlfriends or wives or, or whatnot, that have been self-isolating by themselves. So I'm sure the first day rolling up to that training, I can't wait to get over there and interview these guys of, of what was their first mindset was stepping onto that pitch and, and seeing the guys, because I'm sure, like you talking to the doctor, it was like Christmas morning. They were probably just beaming. Yeah, it's only a matter of time. Um, we're, we're counting the days, we just don't know how far we have to count. I know, all right. Now don't go anywhere because it's five o'clock somewhere when we come back and Onside returns to a few surveys. Gracias, 
Welcome back and welcome to Onside Happy Hour. Now, I've kept something from you the entire show, but we have another special guest. I teased him last week, but I'm absolutely ha buzzing to have Matt Budrick here with us on the show, groundskeeper slash comedian for Inter Miami. Matt, how are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm good. How are you guys? Great. Should we crack open a beer yes. just to like loosen up the mood a bit? Absolutely. It's happy hour. It's five o'clock somewhere, so cheers, everyone. Virtual cheers. Salute. I guess um, let's dive Ooh. into it. This is happy hour. We invite a guest um, every week <laughs> to you know talk shop after uh, after a long day's work. And Matt, I'm assuming you're exhausted because things are sort of getting going again for you. Um, you got to get that pitch immaculate. And so I'm just curious, how did you even get into this? How how does one end up mm -hmm. where you are today? Yeah. So um, it just kind of happened by chance. I uh, I went to. Uh, College, University of Rhode Island, and I played baseball up there. That was my reason for going there. Um, and I started out as a communications major, and I really was not very into it. So um, they had a, a turf management program. So I, I took a couple classes and tried it out, and I really, really liked it. Uh, so I did a couple internships at golf courses uh, up in New England. And then uh, I was fortunate enough to get an internship uh, with the Baltimore Orioles at Camden Yards um, out of college. Worked with them for uh, three seasons and then came down to UCF and that's what moved me down to Florida. Then I was at Orlando City and now I'm in Miami. But, um, you know, it's just something that I tried in school and I really liked the hands-on aspect of it. I wasn't the type of person who can work inside all day and, and you know, sit, sit at a desk and stuff. It's just not my nature. So uh, I wanted something I could do outside. I wanted to be around sports and uh, I, I just really, really enjoyed it from the get-go. Now, one thing about you that I saw, obviously, in Orlando is your commitment to make the field immaculate and perfect. But it was your relationships that you had with the players. Um, how did you balance the two? And and you're just you're so likable. But I, I just want to ask, like, how do you balance the two and how do you stay professional in and around players that sometimes are huge name players or they're up and coming players? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I always tell I always tell the staff or any of my people and I go by the same thing is we don't you know, you don't talk to the you know, you don't talk to the players unless they kind of talk to you, you know, to start mm -hmm. with. Um, and, you know, we, we're kind of around to do our job. But um, if players want to talk to us about the field or whatever and we get into relationships, mm -hmm. that's, that's awesome. I really enjoy that part of it. Um, yeah. We always make sure we have a relationship with the coaches because you know, we want to do whatever we can to help out the team, whatever we can, what they want to do for, for practice, for games, whatever they need, we want to we want to do it for them. Um, but yeah, I always enjoy having good relationships with the players. Most of the time, you know, I enjoy the feedback that they give us on the field. Sometimes it's a little bit too much after a while. You're like, OK, like, you know, we get it. We know we know what we're doing <laughs> at this point. You know, we'll, we'll yeah. do our best. We'll do our best to do it. But. It's always good to hear the feedback, especially when we, we make little changes or do small things that we don't think anyone will notice and players notice it. Um, you know, they may like it. They may say, hey, the ball's playing faster today. We really like it or something. It's always good to have feedback so that we know, you know, whatever we're doing is working or they like this. Um, but again, we, we try to just do our job. We don't want to really be in the way of anything, but um, mm -hmm. we also want to be available in case anybody has feedback, has questions about something, has a request, you know, anything. We want to be available. We want to have good relationships with people. We want to, mm -hmm. you know, have people come up to me and, and, and be open about whatever. Because, you know, groundskeepers in our profession get a rap of like these old uh, grumpy, you know, people. <laughs> And it's true though it is true it's, sometimes but, i mean i mean yes and it's it's true we do get grumpy because you know <laughs> it's just the type of job that we do but mm -hmm. um at the same you know we try not to be like that we try to be a part of everything that's going on so i, I like the feedback from the players and we want to be open to it all the time so uh, as far as feedback goes and you don't have to name names but we do encourage that you do uh have you had anywhere mm -hmm. that experience where someone's just been really upset with something about the pitch and they've let you have it <laughs> Not really, to be honest. I mean, there's time, you know, there was always times where, you know, you're going through tough periods of, of things with weather or some, some situations that are hard to control or the amount of play you have or whatever. But I've always tried to just be, you know, I wanted, I've always been honest about whatever's going on with, with whoever's asking because, you know, you don't want to be, you know, making something up and, 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 you know, saying something is the way it is when it's not or something like that. You want people to trust you when you tell them what's going on. 
That mm -hmm. way, if they see something's wrong or they see something's sh struggle, they know that, you know, it's not, you know, we have it taken care of and it's not the end of the world pretty much. I feel like you played that really safe. There's got to be someone that literally complained about everything. David Beckham is practically blowing up his uh, his text messages right now. Yeah. No, no, no. Honestly, honestly, God's been great, and and oh. it's been it's it's. I know, I, I know you want me to, to say that, but no. honestly, it's no. been. No, no I mean, we don't. My big my biggest problem is always goalkeepers, just because of what they do. Um, yeah. to the field and stuff, but right. but everyone's right. always been really really good about everything. I think if you talk to people the right way and. Uh, the, the other thing I always tell my staff is that we try to have our expectations of what we're doing higher than than the team or anybody else's. That mm -hmm. way, you know, we don't have any issues with something not getting done or something not being the way the team wants to be. So I always feel like if you keep a, a high standard to things, you, you leave a lot less room for people to complain about things. So I don't want to hear complaints. I don't want to, you know, I don't want extra people, you know, in my ear about things if we don't have to. So we try to just do everything, you know, top notch from the start to not have any issues. Yo, Matt, in- um... Okay, I want to ask oh, you- boy. Oh, sorry, go on, Dre. Sure. Okay, in 2015, it's the issue working remotely. Uh, in 2015, I was blown away. I went to cover the um, Copa America in Chile and stadium to stadium, it was essentially a team of scientists working on the pitch with these instruments that would judge the balance of the ball, the role of the ball, in an attempt to try and standardize it so that in a tournament like that, where you know it's a short tournament, national teams, so that you would sort of make it as uniform as possible from city to city. How much sort of science goes into what it is that you're doing? How much you know measuring in order to kind of perfect, you know, millimeter perfect, um, the, the work that you guys do on the pitch? Yeah, a ton. I mean, that's the one thing people don't understand. Uh, you know, it's most people think that we, you know, just paint cut um you know just keep up with things and you know it just stays the way it is but there's obviously way more that goes into it there's a lot of science you're you got to be a meteorologist with the weather you know you got to do a lot of soil work um obviously you're growing the grass um but a lot of chemicals that are involved with what we're doing fertilizers involved with what we're doing um you know there's also a big side of it of being responsible you know with the environment that's the type of job we're in that we try to use more organic type of fertilizers. We try to, to reduce the amount of, uh, you know, pesticides and, and fungicides and stuff we're using until we absolutely have to. Um, so there's a, there's a ton that goes into it. It's a big time science. I mean, calibrating mm -hmm. fertilizers and making sure you're spraying the right chemicals at the right time, you know, timing is everything. And that's the most difficult part of this job. Mm -hmm. Everybody's using the fields all the time. We got a, We got a really aggressive schedule in the stadium. We have a lot of training. We have a lot of uh, academy groups that are training, so so people are on the fields, and that's what they're there for. So it's it's hard for us to try to find the time in between what they're doing, you know, in between the weather, in between the rain, in between the wind, all these conditions to try to find the right times to do the right things. And I think that's the most important part of the job is knowing the right time to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. If you well, don't that, do that, if you if you have issues with that that's when you get into bad timing spots and you really, really have issues with a, a, a tough schedule because because soccer training is, you know, it's every day. Yep. It's yep. very, you know, it's all the time. These guys are always on the field. So it's it's, it's difficult to try to find time. So, uh, Kaylin, I think this is officially the smartest show that we've done so far of uh, uh, onside. Um, I guess I'm not going to lie. I feel useless. Like <laughs> I literally thought that I was reaching and peeking at all my goals and I literally like no, not at all. The two guests we had on today, I'm like, wow, I got work to do. So I, I guess the last question from, from <laughs> me for you, Matt, is, you know, given that you got into the game relatively late and it, and it was through this, through actually working uh, on the pitches, what, what do you like about soccer? What is it that, that really attracted you to, to it beyond just a professional level? I like the day-to-day -day training. I like watching training day-to-day. -day. Um, I think that stuff's really interesting. I think it's, I really enjoy watching the coaches and how they prepare for things. Um, our coaching staff here in Miami has been has been awesome to watch how they do things. It's been pretty incredible. Um, it's a really, really good staff there. So um, I really like to learn that way because, again, I'm still I ask questions every day about things that I still don't understand about the game. But uh, but I understand what they like now for a surface. And, you know, besides that, that's all I really need to know. And then after that, I'm just learning as, as I go with the actual game. <laughs>
Yeah, Matt, this is why you are one of the best in the business. I will be the first and definitely not the last to say that. Uh, you are fantastic and it's because you genuinely love your job. You love what you do and you're invested in learning and growing with the sport. So first off, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we definitely need to catch up. I've been saying this to all my guests, but I'm like so intrigued. We need to catch up for a beer once this coronavirus is gone. Um, so hopefully that is soon. I know. I hope so, too. Thanks for having uh, me. Thanks for coming on. No problem. All right, guys. We had some incredible guests. Dre, honestly, how do you feel about yourself at the I, moment? I can't wait to well, just watch this one back and kick myself for all the questions that I wanted to ask that we don't have enough time to get through. So I'm going to take everyone up on the uh, the beers and the coffee and everything else. We can continue the conversation. I love this stuff, honestly. I love um, the conversation around... Um, the fields and, and what goes into it. I, I've seen it firsthand for major competitions and I know that it's so much more complex than um, maybe people mm -hmm. are aware of. And our talk on um, sports psychology uh, is just, I think I've been waiting basically my whole career to have that conversation. So I'm really happy that it happened today. I was gonna say, Dre, I can't wait to watch the show back just to see your face because you were definitely the kid that comes down Christmas morning with smiling like cheek to cheek. But thank you everyone for tuning in. Dre, once again, absolutely fantastic show with you. I can't wait to get onto that pitch that Matt's created for the Next team the and pitch. for us. I promise I won't wear heels on it, but um, yeah, stay tuned for another uh, episode of Onside coming next week.